Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. the trip just to get that reception. I'm kind of tempted to sneak off now before I ruin it by saying anything. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, President Rutland. Uh, thank you, Matt, for being here on behalf of the Oklahoma Republican Party, which has been, I think, statistically the most successful party in the country. So we're... Uh, <clears throat> and Kara, thank you for welcoming us on behalf of the College Republicans. I have a Long background in college Republicans. I helped found the Emory College Republicans three times during my career. So, uh, I wanted to try to summarize what I think is at stake this fall and why I believe this is the most important election of our lifetime. And also, in a way, I guess why I think I am probably uniquely. Uh, suited to be the Republican nominee if we're serious about not just defeating Obama, but also changing Washington, D.C. And I, w I was with... Uh, I think for the young people who are here, my number one message is that we can change things. That we are not trapped into decay. We're not trapped into weakness in the world. We're not trapped into a decaying culture. We're not trapped into economic decline. These are functions of decisions made by a national establishment which is profoundly wrong about the nature of reality and which has been implementing policies which are profoundly destructive. And so I think it's important. And Herman Cain was campaigning with me on Saturday. And as you know, he's... He's very big on numbers. And so we were talking about his favorite number, which I'll bet all of you know. Not just one. You have to say it three times for Herman to be truly happy. But we were talking about it, and we, as we chatted, he, he said to me, you know, that, that I should be able to, I could summarize the impact that I had as speaker with five numbers. So I'm going to give you that they are. A dollar thirteen, four point two percent, eleven million, two thirds, and four. Let me briefly explain. A dollar thirteen was the price of gasoline on average per gallon while I was speaking. Four point two was the percent of the unemployment rate when I left office. Eleven million is the number of new jobs created in the four years I was speaker. Two out of three are the number of people who left welfare and went to work or went to school through welfare reform. And four is the number of years the federal budget was balanced after the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. I mention that to you because we do not have to have the disastrous policies that Washington is imposing on us. We can, in fact, change things. But it requires boldness, it requires clarity, and it requires courage. Because, of course, the entire establishment will work every day to undermine, ridicule, and minimize the chance of real change. 
Essentially, we have a competition between two worlds. On the one side, there is a left-wing world which has a very particular sense of values and how history should occur. On the other side, there's a classically American conservative world which has a fundamentally different sense. Now, it starts at values. The base of the conservative American understanding of reality is our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, which says we hold these truths to be self-evident. This, this is the first break point between the liberals and the rest of us. The Founding Fathers didn't say we have this theory, we believe in situation ethics. It might possibly be true on Thursdays if it doesn't offend anybody. <laughs> Within political correctness, we would like to suggest maybe I mean, these are folks writing a document to take on the most powerful empire in the world. And they were doing it on behalf of truth. They said, all men are created equal. At a time in 1776 when that was the most radical political statement that had been made at a time of kings, queens, emperors, and czars. And they meant it. Now, were we perfect? No. Did we have slavery? Yes. Did women have a secondary role? Yes. Have we spent 225 years making this the freest, most open society in the history of the human race? Yes. Do we have people who come here from everywhere and learn to be American? Because American is a learned civilization? Exactly. And they went on to assert the heart of American exceptionalism. We are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I want to drive this home for a second because it is central to the choice we are making between Barack Obama and the radical left and American traditional values in history. The Declaration of Independence says that God endows each one of you personally with sovereignty. We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable means no president, no bureaucrat, no judge can come between you and God. Now, this is the heart of our fight with the Obama administration's war against religion. By what right does a secular president impose on a religion his particular version of reality? By what right does he dictate to a religion how they are allowed to worship? He has no right to do that. It is clearly unconstitutional, and he should be stopped. You have my commitment that the day I am inaugurated, that very day, I will sign an executive order repealing every act of anti-religious bigotry by the Obama administration. Now, it goes on to say we're endowed with certain rights, among which are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, which is a second big argument we have with Obama and Saul Alinsky and modern radicalism. The right to pursue happiness in the 18th century actually meant virtue and wisdom, not hedonism and acquisition. The Founding Fathers actually believed that a wise people could remain free, but a foolish people would end up in a dictatorship. You'll notice what you're guaranteed the right to pursue happiness. It doesn't say you're guaranteed the right to happiness. There are no provisions in the Declaration of Independence for happiness stamps for the under-happy. <laughs> there are no provisions in the Declaration of Independence for 
a federal department of happiness to assess whether or not we are meeting up to our minimum happiness requirement. And if somebody had gone to the Founding Fathers and said, do you realize that politicians someday will get to a point where they will come into a room like this and they will say, I'm going to take from the overly happy and redistribute to the underly happy? They would have said, by what right does some arrogant politician believe that they get to personally judge which Americans are allowed to do what? And by what right do they get to set the standard for redistribution? And they would have said, that's the beginning of the end of liberty. That's how wrong Barack Obama is. Now, let me apply this difference in worldviews at a very practical level. The Obama administration is dedicated to an anti-American energy, expensive gasoline policy. This is not an accident. The Secretary of Education, I mean the Secretary of Energy in 2008 said he really wanted to see American prices get to a point where they resemble Europe, where it's nine or ten dollars a gallon. The President has said, you know, you ought to buy smaller cars. Now, let me start with a simple premise that most Oklahomans will understand. You cannot put a gun rack in a vault. <laughs> you know, it takes a genuinely radical administration to turn gasoline policy into an anti-Second Amendment position. But let me carry you a step further. And this is, this is really important. I say this as a former teacher of environmental studies. We used to use a book called The Limits to Growth. It was a fascinating book. I taught environmental studies in the early 1970s. It was really intriguing. It used modern computer technology. It did all sorts of interesting things. It had one profound problem I discovered over the following 20 years. Every single major conclusion was wrong. <laughs> and what you have today with Al Gore and what you have today with Barack Obama are people who still believe in the original book. And what the book said was there are limits to growth. For example, there's a whole concept called peak oil, which makes sense if on the surface. It says, oh, gee, eventually we'll run out. Now, it's technically true, just as eventually the sun will quit producing heat. But it's not a practical problem. It's like the astronomer who went to the small town, gave a lecture, and was awakened at 2 in the morning by somebody who said, did you say the sun would burn out in 5 billion years or 4 billion years? <laughs> and he said, 5 billion. He said, thank God, I can go to sleep now, and hung up. <laughs> Here's what we've learned in the last decade, and this is absolute proof positive. One. We've learned that there are new drilling technologies that enable us to find gas in shale. What we thought into the year 2000 was a seven or eight year supply, we now believe is at least a 125 year supply. In the year 2000, we were going to import liquefied natural gas from the Middle East. Now we believe we're going to export liquefied natural gas to China. Nobody in Washington wants to confront how big a change this is. And yet it's gigantic. Two. North Dakota has 25 times as much oil as the U.S. Geological Survey used to think. Not 25 percent more, 2,500 percent more. And it's a fascinating story because the only reason we know this is it's on private land and the liberals couldn't stop it being developed. If this had been at sea or if this had been on federal land, it still wouldn't be developed. Now, what does this mean? It means if we follow an American energy policy, and if we consciously open up federal land and we consciously open up offshore development, we can create enough oil and gas to be independent of the Middle East, period.
This policy has four great advantages. First, if we decide that we're going to produce enough energy here in America, and there's some evidence that in this decade we're going to be the largest oil producer in the world, bigger than Russia and bigger than Saudi Arabia. If we decide we're going to go and really use all of our sources of energy, it has a huge national security implication. Never again will an American president bow to a Saudi king. Somebody suggested to me we could, we could do a bumper sticker that says stop bowing and start drilling. <laughs> and that would give you the difference between Obama and Gingrich, okay? I'm, I'm on the drilling half, he's on the bowing half. Uh, second big advantage, if we kept $500 billion a year at home buying energy here at home instead of overseas, we create well over a million new high value added jobs and we put Americans back to work and increase the American economy. Now, the president's very proud that in Obamacare, he has extended the length of time you can get your parents' insurance until you're 26. I would like to be able to create enough jobs you can actually get a job and buy your own insurance. Third, the amount of royalties that might be generated by developing all of our energy resources could actually be as high, according to Harold Hamm, who's developed North Dakota, could be as high as 16 to 18 trillion dollars over the next generation. That's about the size of the entire national debt. That's how much it could help us without raising taxes to have the revenues to get back in fiscally good health. Finally, if we go all out to do this, there is no reason we can't get gasoline down between $2 and $2.50 a gallon. Now, the establishment, I got this pushback yesterday, you know, the establishment will say, well, who knows what's going to happen, and after all this, and after all that. Look, this is pretty straightforward. What we do know is, under the Obama policy, prices are going up. What we do know is, under the Obama policies, we depend on Saudi Arabia. What we do know is, under the Obama policies, we create no American jobs with new energy development. With Gingrich policies, what we know is we will dramatically expand our independence of the world market, dramatically expand our capacity to produce energy without regard to our foreign potential enemies, and in the process, prices will clearly be a lot lower. Now, I pick 250 as, as a stabilizing price for capital investment reasons. It could easily go down to two dollars, and here's a fact. It was a dollar thirteen when I was speaker, it was a dollar eighty nine when Obama was sworn in. So why do we have this assumption all of a sudden, oh, gee, that's the distant past. He hasn't been president that long. There's no reason we can't get back down to $2 or $2.50. We know how to create jobs. Ronald Reagan had a policy. Cut taxes, cut regulations, develop American energy, praise the people who create jobs. 16 million new jobs were created. We followed the Reagan policies while I was speaking. 11 million new jobs are created. So if you go to newt.org, you'll see a whole range of job creating steps from zero capital gains tax to bring hundreds of billions of dollars back into the U.S. to invest to a 12.5% corporate tax rate, which will liberate about $700 billion in profits overseas. And by the way, at 12.5%, I tell my liberal friends, General Electric will actually pay taxes. So there's a whole new virtue to this. We want 100% expensing, which means whether you're a farmer, you're a factory, you're a doctor, if you buy new equipment, you write it off in one year. What that does is it allows us to be the most modern system in the world with the most modern equipment so we can compete with China and India and win. At the same time, I would modernize unemployment compensation to require you to sign up for a business-led training program if you sign up for unemployment compensation. So while we're paying you, you're getting retrained to use the new equipment so we have better human capital and better industrial capital simultaneously. It is fundamentally wrong to give people money for 99 weeks for doing nothing. And remember, in 99 weeks, they could earn an associate's degree. I mean, that's how big the mismatch is. In North, in North Dakota, 
where they have a 3.5 percent unemployment rate, they actually would have a zero unemployment rate if they had enough training. They have 16 to 18,000 jobs in the oil industry they can't fill because they don't have the right skills, and they have people over here who can't find a job because they don't have the right skills. If you had a program of matching up the people through training with the jobs, they would probably be close to a zero unemployment rate. I mean, that's the impact of oil development in North Dakota. Two last tax changes. I would abolish the death tax permanently so we do not punish people for being successful. And I believe as a person, as an individual, you should have the option of a 15 percent flat tax. You can keep the current code with all its complexity and all of its paperwork, or you can write down, here's how much I earned, here's how many dependents I have, here's 15 percent, one page. It turned out when we proposed that, we picked 15 percent. This is based on a program in, uh, that they have in Hong Kong that's been working for about 40 years, where they have two options. Uh, we picked 15 percent. It turned out that Governor Romney pays about 15 percent. The liberals all promptly said, that's wrong, he should pay more. I thought this was a good example of liberalism. They said he should pay more. No, as a conservative, I think you should pay less. So I want to bring you down to the Romney rate. And let me be very clear. This again causes great confusion in the Washington establishment. This is not a revenue neutral proposal. This is a tax cut. There will be less revenue in the short run. My goal is to shrink Obama's government to fit the revenue available, not to raise your taxes to catch up with Obama. Let me also say, as part of this program, you need a whole new approach to regulation. I would replace the Environmental Protection Agency with a brand new Environmental Solutions Agency that had to apply common sense and economic reality. And I would modernize the Food and Drug Administration so that it had a commitment to being in the laboratory, understanding the science, and accelerating getting new knowledge to the patient so we had the fastest possible transition so patients got the most modern, best possible care, which also turns out to be a huge job creator in the world market because health will be the single, biggest single market in the 21st century. For the young people here, let me give you an example of the difference between the establishment's austerity and pain-oriented model, in which, by the way, they want you to be austere and you to have pain. Uh, they don't actually apply this to themselves. Uh, and the way I would approach it from a Reaganite tradition of, of growth and opportunity. We need to offer young people the opportunity to have a personal social security savings account that they can invest in themselves. This is not a theory. Chile's been doing it for over 30 years. The city of Galveston, Texas, has been doing it for over 30 years. If you would be allowed to take your part of the Social Security tax, the personal half of it, and you could put it in from the first day you go to work, and it build up compound interest for your entire working career, you end up with two to three times as much money. It is your own personal estate, so if something happens to you, it doesn't go to the government, it goes to your family. It also means the politicians no longer tell you when to retire. It's none of their business. It's your money and it's your savings and you do what you want to. It has two other terrific side effects. A personal Social Security savings account generates so much capital that the economy grows to be six to eight trillion dollars bigger annually by the end of your lifetime because there's so much new investment money. In Chile today, the size of their Social Security Savings Fund is 72 percent of the whole economy. It is so big, they now allow Chileans to invest outside the country because the economy is too small to absorb all the savings. Now take our current indebtedness and compare it with that level of savings. It's a health, much healthier system. Last thing, if you make the, and this is an opportunity, you don't have to do it, but the, although the Social Security actuary estimates that between 95 and 97 percent of all young people would opt for the system because the return is so much bigger. 
If that happens, in one generation, we eliminate 50 percent of the inequality of wealth in America because every worker becomes an investor and a saver, and that changes the entire pattern of American wealth. Now, you're going to hear a lot of talk from Washington about how Gingrich has these ideas that aren't practical, that are too big, you can't get there. I want to just give you one common sense example. Now, I remember my background now. I've been studying this stuff since August of 1958 when I was in high school. I served 20 years in the Congress. I was the first Republican Speaker of the House in 40 years. I was the first re-elected Republican Speaker since 1928. We balanced the budget for four years, the only time in your lifetime it's been done. And we passed welfare reform, the largest entitlement reform of your lifetime. So I'm not standing here as some theoretical abstract person. I actually think we can do this stuff. But let me give you an example of how big the gap is between the practical world that works and Washington. How many of you have ever gone online and tracked down a package at UPS or FedEx? Raise your hand if you've ever done this. Okay, so this is not a theory, right? No, this is very important. You know, you go to Washington and people say, well, that's an interesting idea. No, it is an absolute reality that we have the technology that allows UPS and FedEx at no extra charge to allow you to track your packages in real time. Right? Am I right? This is not a theory, right? So that means that every day they track 24 million packages so well that their customers can track them individually. That's the world that works. That's what I'm basing my whole campaign on. Now you have Washington, where the federal government can't find 11 million illegal immigrants, even if they're sitting still. <laughs> so I have a simple proposal for you. We should send a package to everyone who's here illegally. <laughs> and then when they get it, you know, we can find out exactly where they are. I mean, <laughs> now let me say for my friends in the press, that was hyperbole. We don't need a fact checker to go out and... But do you understand the point I'm driving at? The scale of the gap between the incompetence of the federal government and, frankly, state and local governments, and what we routinely now see in the modern world, that's how big our opportunity is. And this is the fight between liberalism and conservatism. I want to actually modernize government so it moves at the speed, the efficiency, and with the money savings you expect in the private sector. They want to regulate the private sector so it becomes as inefficient and as incompetent as government. Let me talk briefly about one last topic and then we're going to take questions. All of you should be very deeply concerned about national security. Barack Obama is the most dangerous president in modern American history. Someone was arrested over the weekend for trying to blow up the U.S. Capitol. They happen to be from Morocco. Under the Obama administration's willful dishonesty, it would be highly inappropriate to describe what motivated them because that would be somehow politically incorrect. Now, imagine in 1946, we had tried to describe the Soviet Union, and the government had said, you're not allowed to use the word communist. Now, I mean, any honest person knows what motivated somebody who came here. And this is not smearing everybody. This is not Islamophobia. If we can't have an honest conversation about radical Islamists, and we can't figure out there is a very specific group of people across the planet. These are not Norwegian Rotarians. <laughs> yeah. There's a very specific desire to kill us. There's a desire to destroy our civilization. This, this, look, churches are being burned in Nigeria. Churches are being burned in Egypt. Uh, the fact is 
that there were people who represent a minority sect of Islam who were being killed in Indonesia. Across the planet today, the forces of religious repression are on the march, and, they, and this administration has intellectually disarmed, it is morally disarmed, it is incapable of describing what threatens us. When somebody who's a, a major in the U.S. Army jumps up at Fort Hood, yells Allahu Akbar, kills 13 Americans and wounds 30, carries in his wallet something that says warrior of Allah, and we write a report which doesn't even reference radical Islam, that is willfully dishonest, and then we adopt a budget based on that dishonesty. So the president wants to unilaterally weaken the United States. He wants to cut the aid to Israel for its anti-ballistic missile defense. He, he refuses to take Iran seriously. We are in a world that is very dangerous. And I say this to those of you who, are, who are, represent the next generation, because you're going to bear the consequences. We are really at risk someday in your lifetime of losing an American city. We should be very sobered by the threats that are around the world. When Ahmadinejad, the dictator of Iran, gets up and says, Israel can be eliminated from the face of the earth, we should assume he means Israel can be eliminated from the face of the earth. And this is not... So defeating Barack Obama becomes, in fact, a duty of national security. Because the fact is, he is incapable of defending the United States. I wear, this pin is the flag that George Washington flew in front of his command post at Valley Forge. I wear it to remind myself and to remind you that when they met in the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, the man who presided over the Constitution has spent eight years in the field as the Commander-in-Chief. He spent one week at Mount Vernon in eight years. Now, when they wrote the President is Commander-in-Chief, they meant the President is Commander-in-Chief. The number one job of the President of the United States is to protect the citizens and the country from enemies foreign and domestic. I promise you that if, with your help, I become the Commander-in-Chief, I will take no duty higher than to protect the Constitution, to protect the United States, and to protect the people of the United States and our allies from those who would destroy us, because there can be no higher obligation if, in fact, we're going to have a decent life in the future. I'm very grateful to have this chance to share ideas with you. I look forward to your questions. Let me just say, I hope every single one of you is going to vote. Your participation really matters, and I think it's really, really important that the United States recognizes, the people recognize, that this election it may well be the most important election of our lifetime, and we need everyone to be actively engaged. And I look forward to the questions. Speaker Gingrich, how are you? Good. Good. My name's Christine. Um, I'm a government major here at ORU. And my question is in regards to health care. Um, I'm just wondering um, what the federal government's role is in health care and what reform you would enact to um, help keep the quality of health care high but the costs from getting out of control. Well, first of all, I would say that the, uh, one of the first things, if you go to newt.org, our, our first goal under a proposed 21st century contract with America is to repeal Obamacare completely. And we would campaign this fall with the pledge that the new Congress, when it's sworn in on January 3rd, would stay in session and would repeal Obamacare before I was sworn in on January 20th so that we could go ahead and sign it on the very first day. I think you then have to replace it with a system which, frankly, is local. What we really want is the patient, the doctor, and the hospital at a local level because health care in the end is going to become more and more personal. 
The more we know about the human genome, the more we know about, you, about your background as a unique individual, the more we're going to be designing solutions that really fit one person. And what you don't want to do is have a Washington bureaucracy make broad sweeping decisions which are fundamentally and profoundly wrong. They may be right for 80 percent and they may kill 20 percent. And that's why you want to get medicine back to the level of the doctor, the patient, and the hospital. There are reforms we need. Uh, I helped found the Center for Health Transformation, and we have dozens of specific ideas that would improve the system, starting with, for example, if you want to take costs out of the system, no single thing will take more costs out of the system than litigation reform. Okay? Thank you. Ah, back and forth. Hey, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my name is Jackson Lawmeyer, and my question for you is, if you are the GOP nominee, how do you plan on swaying my generation to vote for you when in 2008 my generation overwhelmingly supported Barack Obama? Well, look, I think, I think younger people overwhelmingly supported Barack Obama in, in 2008 because his slogan was, yes, we can. Uh, his slogan this year is going to be, why we couldn't. Uh, <laughs> So, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, here's what I would do on campus. I'd go on campus and say, Newt Gingrich wants you to have a personal social security account you're going to own that's going to give you or two or three times as much money, and no president's ever going to go to threaten people that they're not going to get their checks. Newt Gingrich wants you to have a job so you can actually move out from your parents, buy your own insurance, and have your own place to stay. Um, Newt Gingrich wants you to have 250 a gallon gasoline so you can go find work. Uh, and Newt Gingrich wants you to be physically safe from foreign danger so you can enjoy the life you just earned by having the job you just got. And someday you can enjoy the retirement you'll have earned by actually having your own savings account. So that's the package I'd offer. Thank you. By the way, you will notice, I say this to the students who are here you'll notice that your parents are even more excited than you are <laughs> by the idea of you having your own job and moving out. Hi, Speaker Gringish. My name is uh, Trenton, and I was wondering, what are you going to do to help support Israel if you're elected president? The, um, that's, that's a really good question, and particularly with the news today that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will be here on March 5th. Let me say two things. One. On the first day I am president, I will sign an executive order placing the American Embassy in Jerusalem in recognition of Israel's right to its own sovereignty. I believe we have to have a strategy using all the kind of techniques that President Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher and Pope John Paul II used against the Soviet Empire. We have to strategically plan to find ways that are non-military to replace the dictatorship in Iran. But I would also say bluntly, no American can second guess an Israeli prime minister on the matter of survival. If, if you were Benjamin Netanyahu and you knew that in your parents' generation seven million Jews had been killed because people didn't believe a dictator who said he wanted to wipe them out, then asking them to take any significant risk with an Iranian nuclear weapon is, I think, morally indefensible. And I believe that the correct answer is to say to the Iranians, you need to stop your program before you get hit. But you should be under no illusions if you refuse to stop your program long before it's completed. You are going to get hit, and we are not in any way going to stop the Israelis from defending themselves. By the way, that's also why we should have a crash program to drill here, drill now, because not only would we pay less, but we would be more secure. And I think it's very important, given how dangerous the world is, for us to maximize the rate at which we become energy independent, precisely so we don't have to be threatened in any way by blackmail in the Persian Gulf. Yes, ma'am. Speaker Gingrich, my name is Jasmine Cotton, and I have a two-part question. Um, you stated earlier about American, or how America is... Um, a learned civilization, and also you stated before about how America is a multi-ethnic 
nation, but not necessarily multicultural. So my questions are, how do you define true American culture, and what policies do you plan to put in place, given our history and divisions, to further unify this multi-ethnic nation? Uh, you know, that, that's a tremendous question. I'm really glad you asked it. Um, I think there, I've written a whole bunch of books on this, and uh, my wife, Cliss, and I have done several movies on it, and, and uh, she wrote a children's book called Sweet Land of Liberty about the founding of America uh, for four to eight-year-olds. And we did it because we really do think that for the last two generations, our academic leadership, uh, not here, but at a lot of other places, has clearly been trying to, hi trying to hide from America. I mean, basically, you have schools that don't teach American history anymore. You have kids who are graduating who don't know anything about American history. Uh, and so how can you learn American civilization if you don't learn it? What's fascinating, I, all of you can test this out. And you, can, you could go probably on campus, certainly you could go around Oklahoma and test this out. People will come here from all over the world. And back home, they might have been poor. They might have had no future. They might, I, I always used to say that Arnold Schwarzenegger was a great example. If Arnold Schwarzenegger had stayed in a small town in Austria, he would have been unknown, had probably worked all his life for a modest income, but he showed up here, and he had really big ambitions. And he ended up doing lots of different things, because in this country, you can come from anywhere and be astonishingly successful. Look at the founders of Google. I mean, it's amazing what we do to enable people to rise. And so I start with this idea that we have to think, in my mind, it is partly the Declaration of Independence. Your rights come to you from God. It's very central, which also means, by the way, you have a responsibility because now God has paid attention to you and you have some obligation to think through, so how can you be a citizen worthy of God having endowed you? Partially, I believe, and this got me in, in, in some interesting arguments recently with some liberal friends, I believe every American has an absolute obligation to work. I believe working is an integral part of being an American. And I think we need to reassert that. And we need to say, look, you know, if we're going to compete with China and India and Korea, our kids are going to study more. That's just, it's just an objective fact. We're not genetically that superior. We're not, you can't say, I only have to study half as much because look how smart I am. It ain't true. <laughs> you know, and, I, and I think you'll just go down the list. And so uh, I, I believe that there are lessons in our history. There are lessons of how we work together. Uh, there are lessons about how we organize our Constitution. You know, it's a huge mistake that we, we encourage all of these other countries to adopt a political structure which isn't geographic. One of the things that makes America work is that your congressmen and your senators represent specific areas. It ties them to reality. It gets them away from theoretical ideology. When you go to these, four, like Iraq and, and others have adopted a, a European style list which political scientists just love. It's really elegant. It only has one problem. It doesn't work. It's like a lot of things that theoreticians like a lot. They just don't know no noise to the world. So I would say there are a whole series of things we are a weird combination of idealism and practicality. And, and the last thing I guess I'd say is, I don't know any way to learn America except to study American history. But when you learn about an Abraham Lincoln, or you, or you learn about Martin Luther King Jr., or you learn about Henry Ford, you know, or you learn about Bill Gates or about Steve Jobs, you're learning about this, this churning, energetic, creative system that we have invented, uh, which has made more people wealthier created more opportunities and expanded more, more chances to pursue happiness than any society in the history of the world by orders of magnitude. My name is Monica Carpenter, and I am a major in international community development. And my question for you is, what is your policy on foreign aid and supporting countries that are developing and in crisis, and what actions are you going to take to approve it? Yeah, I, I think this is, this is a good example, by the way, about the challenge of thinking about the lessons of America. I think I, I'm, I'm working right now on a paper that goes back and looks at all the foreign aid we've given away since 1945, and particularly looking at specific countries where we, we spent, Haiti is a good example, we spent huge amounts of money in Haiti, and Haiti is a tragedy. I mean, every American should be bothered that just off our shore is a relatively tiny country that we first intervened in in 1923. And we still haven't succeeded. I mean, there's something profoundly wrong. 
We're doing, you know, if, if you keep trying to cook dinner and you can't get any dinner cooked, at some point you've got to figure out you need a new cookbook. <laughs> and, and so I, I believe if we, had, if we had, and this is the thought process I want all of you to think about, if we had taken half or two-thirds of our foreign aid money and turned it into an investment tax credit for businesses to actually go in and create jobs and create factories and earn a living and make a profit and teach people free enterprise, I think those countries would be radically better off today, have much higher standard of living, and be much freer than they are when you have government to government aid, which turns out to be corrupting and which sends exactly the wrong signal. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Martin. Uh, my question is if you uh, believe that the Department of uh, education should be shrinked. Um, how would this affect uh, the aid that low-income college students receive? Well, let me draw a distinction. First of all, I think that the Department of Education should be dramatically shrunk. I think all the regulations should go back to the state level. And, and, and frankly, I would tell the states all the regulations ought to go back to the local level from the states, too. I'm not a big fan of the states. In terms of student aid, I, I'll make two observations. I, I, I am for the Pell Grant program. I think Pell, the Pell Grant program has helped expand the opportunity for people. But I would also urge everybody, I, I was saying this uh, earlier to your president, I would, I would urge everybody uh, to look seriously at the College of the Ozarks and the four or five other work-study colleges that exist. These are college, and the College of the Ozarks, which I visited and spent time with, you cannot apply unless you need student aid, and they don't have any. And so what they do have is 15 hours a week of work during the school year plus two 40-hour weeks. That pays tuition and books. In the summer, you work 40 hours a week. That pays room and board. 92% of the students graduate owing zero. 8% graduate owing an average of $5,000 because they bought a car their senior year. Now, you compare that to the current model we've foisted on the country. Student aid has actually led students to take fewer courses and take longer to get out. I mean, just look at the statistical numbers. This is, you know, so the student aid program, the way we've currently designed it, because it understates the, 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 the long-term cost to you of borrowing the money, makes it easier to not be aggressive about getting through. It also means that universities and colleges expand their cost. Public universities have gone up consistently for the last five or six years at a faster rate than private universities. And the fact is that higher education costs resemble uh, health care and their unending increase. And so the question I'd raise in part is, how do we get to a relatively low-cost learning system that enables every single young American to work uh, and, and, and to get through school? And, and also, how do we recognize that learning is going to be a lifetime experience? So I'm, I'm for Pell Grants. I'm frankly bold enough. I'd like to see Pell Grants for K through 12 uh, so that parents and children could also choose at that level. Um, I just, you know, I, if you say voucher, liberals get all excited. But since liberals love Pell Grants, they get really confused if you suggest Pell Grants for K through 12. Uh, but, I, but I think the model's right. Uh, and I do think we want to be a universally educated country. The other point I make to all of you, and I say this to, you know, at 68 years of age with a PhD and all that stuff, you live in a world where you're never going to quit learning. I mean, we've got to really rethink from the ground up what does it mean to learn? And how do you learn, and how do we make it easy? Uh, some of it's going to be online. Some of it's going to be a variety of short courses. Uh, some of it's going to be very intense. But all of you are going to discover, those of you who are students here, when you get out, it's just beginning. You know, in the old days, a master's degree actually was having mastered something. A PhD was called a terminal degree. I mean, the only terminal degree you get now is death. <laughs> Otherwise, you have to learn your whole life. And I think we have to really rethink how we're going to finance that and how we're going to make it available to everybody. Good afternoon, Speaker Gingrich. Um, my name is Brandon. I'm a double major here in ORU. Um, first of all, I want to apologize. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. And me being a devout Christian um, of the, excuse me, devout disciple of the Christian faith, I understand um, forgiveness and um, forgetting past mistakes. And you even stated before that personal matters shouldn't be brought up so much in political, in political things. 
And I may agree with you on this, but however, we can see that many of the general public and the media does not agree with you on this statement. Um, with that being said, how do you intend to beat the negative media, reobtain the trust of the American people, obtain the GOP nomination, and beat President Obama in the upcoming election? I think by being honest and being open. I think people can look at my life. As I said a while ago, I'm 68 years old. I'm a grandfather. People can look at how close my relationship is with my wife, Callista. They can look at my relationship with our two daughters, Kathy and Jackie, who are both campaigning for me and their husbands are. They can look at how close I am to my two grandchildren, Maggie, who's 12, and Robert, who's 10, who are my two senior debate coaches. Um, <laughs> and then they've got to make up their own mind. I mean, I, I, I've lived a long life. I've done some things that I've had to uh, go to God and, and seek uh, forgiveness and reconciliation for, but I also think on balance that I've, I've worked very, very hard to be the kind of citizen and the kind of person uh, that would be worthy of your trust in the presidency. People have to make up their minds. Speaker Gingrich, uh, my name is Daniel Apple and my question is in regards to foreign policy. Um, my question is, specifically in Iran, how can we call them the aggressor of the Middle East when America currently has 48 military bases surrounding them? Well, same reason we thought of the Soviet Union as being aggressive when we had bases surrounding it. I mean, you know, the... Uh, You know, we don't have any bases particularly surrounding France. Uh, we don't wake up late at night and worry about the French nuclear weapon, although they've had one, I think, since the 1960s. Uh, but we do worry about the nature of the Iranian regime. Part, first of all, they kill people around the world. Uh, I mean, they are clearly tied. We had two, even in the Obama administration, we had two people testify last week that there's a direct tie between Iran and al-Qaeda. So if even the Obama administration's figured it out, you know the tie's got to be pretty obvious. Uh, at the same time, <laughs> the Iranians have been involved. The, the Iranians began waging war against us with the, Iran, with the hostage crisis of 1979. And they see it that way. They say that to themselves. Uh, you know, they're proud of that particular example, even though it violated international law. They killed Americans at Kobar Towers. I don't think anybody doubts that was an Iranian operation in Saudi Arabia. They killed the Marines in Lebanon in 1982. Again, that was an Iranian operation, not, not a, uh, an outside operation. So you go down this list of things. Uh, I'm sorry, 1983. But you go down the list of things, and they're consistently engaged in terrorism around the world. They just had three different countries where there were efforts to kill Israeli uh, diplomats. In all three, the ties are back to Iran. Uh, and, and so the Iranians have to be seen. They are the leading developers of state terrorism on the planet. They say publicly that they want to eliminate Israel from the face of the earth, and they want to drive the United States out of the Middle East, and they're openly trying to get nuclear weapons. Now, that, all, that strikes me as all being, frankly, pretty good evidence that this is a country you ought to worry about. That's Um, my name is Bethany Allen. I'm a government major here at Oral Roberts, and um, I represent the College Democrats here on campus. And from my personal experience, I have seen um, many of my fellow students who have only had their only meals at school during the day, and they're not necessarily worried about math or science tests, even if they're given an incentive, which you openly agree with. And I um, read that you openly referred to Obama as the food stamp president. Even though food stamps has been, food stamp distribution has been a part of this country before Obama became president. My question to you is, I want to know how you plan on reforming this system to distinguish between who needs it and who doesn't. Yeah, well, let, let me describe for a second why, why I describe President Obama as the most, what I say is he's the most effective food stamp president in American history. And I say that because his policies have kept unemployment higher than at any time since the Great Depression. And as a result, more Americans are in food stamps today. And they've changed the rules. I mean, you can be worth a million dollars. And if you don't have any income, you're eligible for food stamps. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why should average working Americans be subsidizing somebody who's worth a million dollars? But they've, the rules have been changed over and over to maximize eligibility. Uh, second, we've gotten to be a society where, where we don't encourage the work ethic. We explain why dependency is just fine. And, and
you know, I, I, I take a very different approach to this than Governor Romney, who said the other week that he didn't worry much about the very poor because they had a safety net. I, I don't think that's right. I believe, if you look at our Declaration of Independence, it says, you know, we are endowed by our Creator with certain unenable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't just say we the rich or we the upper middle class. It says every American. And so I actually believe conservatives have a special obligation to rethink the entire system because you want to replace a safety net, which often becomes a spider web that keeps people trapped at the bottom. You want to replace it with a springboard, and you want to consciously meet your challenge, which is how could you reach out to the poorest communities and the poorest neighborhoods in the country? How could you ensure that they had work? How could you ensure that they had, that they had take home pay? How could you help them learn in a way? My, my principle is you get a first job, then you get a better job, then someday you own the job. And so how could you make that easy and doable? And uh, I started working on this with Jack Kemp back in 1978. We, we looked at things, for example, like allowing people in public housing to take care of their own housing project and to actually earn equity in it over time by doing the right things and learning how to take care of themselves. I work with Habitat for Humanity, which actually teaches poor people how to build a house so by the time they finish building the house, they've learned how to take care of it, which turned out to be a much better model than Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because you actually are teaching people how to do something. You're not just giving them something that they can't deal with. So I think you raised a very important question and a very good one. But, uh, but I'm, not I'm not attacking the president. He, he didn't invent food stamps. And I'm not saying people shouldn't be on food stamps if there's no alternative. What I'm saying is his economic policies, his energy policy, actually limit the number of jobs we're creating. In, in, in the Reagan years, this is why it's going to be much harder for Obama to get reelected. In the Reagan years, by this stage, we had recovered from Jimmy Carter's recession rapidly enough. The, the Reagan campaign slogan, was, was leadership that is working. And they were relating to how many new jobs we were creating every single month and the fact that, that unemployment was coming down very dramatically. Well, if that was happening, you'd have a lot fewer people in food stamps and a lot more people with paychecks. And I'd like to be the paycheck president, and I'd like to adopt policies that get us to the largest possible employment level with people actively pursuing a better life because they earn it. Okay. Thank you. Good, af good afternoon, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, my name is Chandler. I am a sophomore public relations um, major here at Oral Roberts University. And my question for you is, in the most simplest terms, um, what is the role of government in my life? Uh, in the simplest terms, it is to keep you safe from enemies foreign and domestic, to provide a framework of the rule of law within which you can be guaranteed equality against all of the people, no matter how wealthy or powerful. Uh, and ideally, uh, to ensure that certain basic health conditions are met. For example, uh, I actually think that we should have clean water. Uh, and I, you know, I, it, 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 I know it's bold, it's out on the edge, but I'm prepared to say yes. I think organized society should make it possible that wherever I go in the country, if I go into a restaurant, the water is drinkable. Now, that requires organized structure. I mean, I always remind my conservative friends who say, you know, they want, they want weak government. This is not what they want. The, the Constitution is strong, limited government. But people who say to me, you know, do you want, do you want sound money? Do you want a dollar as good as gold? All my conservative friends nod yes. That is not a weak government. Do you want the border control? They all nod yes. That is not a weak government. Do you want to be defended from potential enemies in the Middle East? They all nod yes. I mean, so what they really mean is, they want a government which follows the Constitution in limiting itself to those things that are essential and having the rest of it be freedom without micromanagement and without bureaucratic regulation. Okay? Let me just say to all of you, you have been a terrific audience. This has been and is and will remain an extraordinary election year. Um, as a historian, I think this may be uh, the most open election on the Republican side since 1940. And if you had asked me a year ago, I would have had no idea uh, how many ups and downs. I mean, uh, I, I tell people it's like riding Space Mountain at Disney. You know, those, those of you running to know, it's a, it's a roller coaster in the dark. So you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going, and you're not sure where you are. Uh, 
And all, and all I can tell you is I think the American people in the end will think all of this through, uh, and I think that we will end up uh, in, in what I think will turn out to be maybe the most consequential election of your lifetime. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for being here.